Good evening, I'm Elder Harris. Uh, today we're going to talk about John chapter 4. Um, those of you all that have seen the previous videos, you're aware that we've been discussing the Gospel of John and going uh, chapter by chapter. Um, and you're also aware that we come into the study having already read the, the Gospel. Um, that's to say the chapter that we're about to cover. So uh, what I want to start out with <clears throat> is a quick tie-in um, of John chapter 3. When we left off with John chapter 3, we left off with John the Baptist having to interact with his own disciples and how they were telling John the Baptist that Jesus was now baptizing and had a greater ministry following than John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was very mature about it. He was very focused about it. He says that, uh, that John the Baptist himself would have to decrease so that Jesus can increase. And John the Baptist remembered that the main point and the main goal of the entire ministry setting of that time was to point towards people accepting Jesus. Well, as we move into John, the fourth chapter, we see that not only did John the Baptist's disciples notice that Jesus's ministry following was pretty massive, but Jesus's religious opponents or the leaders of the Jewish faith, the Pharisees specifically, they had noticed that Jesus had a pretty big following as well. And so at noticing that the Pharisees were kind of paying attention to Jesus and his following and tracking him, at that point we have Jesus wanting to depart from the Judea region and go north to where, toward a region called Galilee. So that's part of what happens in verses 1 through 3, actually in John 4. And chapter, or verse 4 of John 4 has a a note about the area that Jesus chose to go through. Now, let me stop here and step off line of the narrative so that we can get some context. Jesus is going to go through Samaria. Jesus, a Jew, is going through the region called Samaria with a bunch of Samaritans. Now, this was not something that was common. The Samaritans and the Jews did not get along, and that's because the people of Samaria Though they shared a bloodline, they shared uh, certain commonalities with the Jewish people, that's to say those of Hebrew blood, through war and conquest in history, the Samaritans and the area of Samaria had become uh, contaminated. By contaminated, I mean the Assyrians that had uh, taken over the, the area of Samaria had brought in folks from different regions of the world with different belief systems, uh, different values and priorities. And those people came into the Samaria region and they began to intermingle, intermingle that is to say, um, marry, uh, have sex with, uh, make children in the area of Samaria. And so by the time of the text, the Samaritans were not full-blooded Jewish people. And so they were not full-blooded Jewish people. They did not have a full adherence to the Jewish Old Testament books. And they were uh, also regarded as unclean because they weren't full-blooded Jewish, nor were they in keeping with the Jewish faith and the Old, uh, Old Testament according to the Jews. As a matter of fact, the Samaritans were disliked by the Jews. The Jews were disliked by the Samaritans. Um, and a number of folks, that is to say a number of um, nationalities, just had a general disdain for Samaritans. It was one of those situations where the Samaritans had a different Old Testament law, that is to say the Jewish Torah that was common amongst all the area where the Jews lived was not common in Samaria. Samaria had their own version of it, their own version of the first five books of the Bible. They also had their own place of worship where in this geographical area, all the Jews knew that Jerusalem was the place where you go to worship. The Samaritans, nope, they had a different tabernacle or a different temple in a different place, in a different mountain. And the Samaritans also had a different view of how history went um, than the view of the Jews. And so the Samaritans had a very, very different uh, culture and lifestyle and belief system than the Jews to the point where the Jews, if they had to travel north from the region of Judea to the region of Galilee, 
they would literally go and cross a river and go up the opposite side of the river, the opposite side of the road, the opposite side of the river to get where they were going because they literally didn't even want to be in the geographic area where Samaritans were. Samaritans were considered unclean. And so in John chapter 4, verse 4, when we find that Jesus here, he must needs go through Samaria, we know that it is not absolutely necessary that Jesus travel through Samaria by way of um, uh, a route he has to go. This must needs is a reference to Jesus' adherence to the Father's will. This is a divinely appointed visit, a stop through by Jesus because he wanted to go through there and meet someone. The Father wanted Jesus to go through there and meet someone. Jesus could have gone around like everyone else. He did not. So verse 5 says Jesus comes to a city in Samaria, and we're back in the narrative now. Uh, the city is called Sychar. Um, if you were to do a word study and, and try to figure out what Sychar means, it means something like uh, drunken, like intoxicated because of alcohol. Um, but that's what Sychar means. And Jesus comes to a well. Now, Jesus being all God and all human, we see some evidence of his humanity in that Jesus comes to this area and the Bible says in verse 6 he was weary because of his journey. And it also says it was about noon, verse 6 of uh, John chapter 4, which means that Jesus in traveling got so tired, it's the heat of the day in the Middle East, mind you, that he got toward this, this place near this well and he basically was so tired he had to stop and rest. So for those that you know have an issue with you know Jesus being all God and all human, there are evidences throughout the Gospels that Jesus had uh, to deal with the human body the same way we had to deal with. Jesus was tired. You know, at noon in the Middle East, you know it is hot. As a matter of fact, I was in the Middle East last year, um, and I was in Arizona very recently. And what I noticed about these hot, dry places is that people in the daytime are not outside. Not happening. You want to see people outside in these hot and dry places, you got to wait till the sun goes down or before the sun comes up. Here it is, Jesus is making this traveling journey. He's tired, it's hot, and he has to take a break here. And Jesus makes contact with this woman from Samaria, and he asks her to give him a drink. Now, you remember what I just told you about the Jews and the Samaritans. Not only do they not get along, it's expected that they won't even make that attempt. The Jews will oftentimes go around the area of Samaria, and Samaritans are not expected to be any of the regions in which there are a lot of Jews. Now, Jesus at this point, when he makes contact with the woman, he's actually alone because his disciples, Jesus' traveling mission, ministry team, his traveling missionary team, his disciples have left Pastor Jesus at this point near the well so they can go into the Samaritan town and get some food. And so Jesus makes contact with this woman. He says, well, I mean, give me something to drink, you know. Um, and of course, her reaction is shock because she can tell that this is a Jew that is literally speaking to her right now. And so the woman, as opposed to dealing directly with Jesus with regard to his, you know, um, his request for something to drink because he's thirsty, it's hot outside, it's noon, um, 12 o'clock p.m., uh, she says, how is it, and I'm going to paraphrase here, how is it that you or a Jew are asking me, a woman of Samaria, for anything? Because you ought to know, and everybody here knows, that the Jews and Samaritans, we don't mix, we don't share cups, we don't uh, uh, work together. There are no dealings that the Jews have with the Samaritans. So I don't know where you get off, I don't know if you know where you're at, but you're off. You've misread the situation. In verse 9, that's what this woman says. In verse 10, Jesus doesn't respond to the, the stopping point that the woman tries to put up to, to Jesus. You know, Jesus says, give me something to drink. And she says, do you even know where you're at? You're not supposed to be talking to me. I'm not supposed to be talking to you. And Jesus says two things. If you knew two things, verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and you knew the identity of the person that's asking you for a drink, you'd be asking him for living water. So let me say that again. Jesus told the woman that if she knew the gift of God and the identity of the person that was engaging her, that she would respond very differently. As a matter of fact, she would be asking Jesus 
for a different type of water, a water called living water. Well, after that, the, the woman, she's you know looking at Jesus, trying to figure out what's what. Um, in our studies, we've noted that Jesus, many a times, he speaks in a type of speech to where it's a double meaning because Jesus is intensely and completely spiritual. Jesus uses natural terms to connect with natural people, but also to convey spiritual truths. And so Jesus uh, talked to her about living water thus far, but she hasn't quite picked up that there is a spiritual meaning of this living water. And so in verse 11, the woman, she says that, um, I, I don't know how you expect to get anything out of this well. Uh, you don't have a pot. I don't see any ropes. I don't see any cups. This well is deep. Some historians have noted that the well could be in the, between 30 and 50 feet deep at the time. Other historians have noted that the well may have been as deep as 100 feet. In either case, you're going to need some materials to get some drink from this well. And you're talking to me about living water? You see, the woman at the, the well, she was like, where did you get living water when you don't have anything to pull water out of the well from? Her mind was only perceiving the natural water, the H2O at the bottom of the well, and she had yet to connect with Jesus' offer to grant her living water. So verse 12, she also says, not only do you not have anything to get water, and you're talking about this special type of water, the special type of water you're talking about, why do you think it's any better than our common ancestor Jacob? Who do you think that you are that you can have a water that's better than our grandfather Jacob drank, than our grandfather's kids drank, and then our grandfather's cattle drank? Jacob was a common ancestor of the Jews and the Samaritans. And so the Samaritan woman is like, why do you feel like your water is so much greater than our great, 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 great granddaddy Jacob's? You know, what's, what's, what's your deal? Where are you going to get? Why is this water such a big deal to you? You're talking about living water. I haven't seen any ability of you to draw water from this well. And Jesus responds again, of course, in spiritual terms, really trying to get at her understanding. So she understands what this living water is, not just the natural water at the bottom of the well. Jesus says in verse 13, he says, whoever drinks of this water from the well at which we're standing, you know, the, the water in the water pots. If somebody drinks from that natural water, they're going to be thirsty again. But Jesus says in verse 14, says, whoever drinks of the special type of water that I give them, they're never going to thirst again. As a matter of fact, if they drink of the water that I'll give them, this is Jesus talking, they're going to have the water in them, and the water inside them is going to be like a spring that springs up and, and gives the water of everlasting life. And so Jesus said, Jesus is articulating to this woman that the water that he's referring to is no longer about the natural water because he's, he's parched. He's telling this woman that she wants his different type of water, the living water, so that she can be refreshed permanently. Now, you know and I know, us having the advantage of retrospect, that the inner desire of a person, um, and especially in this intensely... Uh, the religious time and area was that people could connect with God and be on the right track to eternal life. That's an inner hunger or an inner thirst. And so Jesus is saying that if you drink of the living water that I give you, you're not going to have to worry about that type of thirst anymore. You will have everlasting life inside you. So the woman, not fully understanding the spiritual implications of Jesus' words, she at the very least gets that the water that Jesus has is going to be a type of water where she will be permanently refreshed and never be thirsty again. And her natural response is, I want it. She, in verse 15, it says, uh, sir, give me this water that I thirst no more, neither come here out to this well in the middle of the day to draw water anymore. And at that point, there's almost like a, uh, a switch to the narrative. It would appear to some that Jesus changes the subject. But this is the natural progression of the way um, interacting with God is going to go. You see, the woman at the well, she finally got to a point where she asked Jesus for the living water, for the gift of God, from the person that is the one that could give this gift of God, this everlasting life, this spring that would spring from them, springs of everlasting life. And when she finally asked him, Jesus, she finally asked Jesus for his living water, 
Jesus has to call attention to her immoral lifestyle. Jesus asks her, go call your husband and then y'all come here. And she, you know, she answered Jesus. She had to be smart about this because she had some skeletons in the closet. She had a, let's call it a checkered past. Um, she had been busy is, a, is perhaps a nice way to put it. Um, but what she said is she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right. You don't have a husband. He says, up to this point, you've had five husbands, and the one you're with right now is not your husband. And so Jesus has exhibited to her, not only does he know about her lifestyle and about her sin, he also gave her the opportunity to confess about her misdeeds in the past, to confess how what she'd done up to this point was not working. And so when Jesus makes it known to her, that he knows about her having all these different husbands. She finally gets it that Jesus is a spiritual man. Jesus, like a prophet, has his ear to the mouth of God. And she says, sir, I perceive now that you're a prophet. Finally, right? She finally gets that Jesus is a spiritual man. And she says, seeing as how, you know, you're a prophet, maybe you can settle this debate. The great debate, one of the great debates in between the Jews and the Samaritans. And one of those great debates is, where we're supposed to worship you know where should there be a temple you know what location is the right location because the way i told you the samaritans had a different place that they worship god through sacrifice and, and and other means but the jews obviously worshiped in jerusalem and so she poses this question to jesus and jesus says you need to believe me that this is verse 21 believe me that there's coming a time and that time is, is here where worship of God the Father is not going to be restricted to a mountain or a temple. Verse 22, he says that the Samaritans, you all really don't fully understand worship and, and how you're to worship God because salvation is of the Jews. Now, when Jesus says salvation is of the Jews, He's not only telling the Samaritan woman that her uh, theology and a, a number of her practices are incorrect. He's telling her that the Old Testament um, Torah or the law, the first five books of the Bible, all those things that came from the Jewish bloodline, the Hebrews, um, and, and that Jewish faith is where all that came from. Furthermore, salvation being of the Jews, you can't forget that Jesus' name means salvation or Jehovah saves. And Jesus was literally having the conversation with her as a Jew. And so Jesus corrects her and lets her know right then and there that it's not about the place, but you should know that the Jews have it right. And then in verse uh, 23, he goes on to explain this to her. He says, true worship from this point forward is really going to be about when people connect with God the Father spiritually. Verse 24, of course, says that God is a spirit. And when people worship him, they got to worship him in both spirit and in truth. That, that is to say that the spirit of man and the spirit of God have to uh, convene to have an exchange here. That, that worship, that dialogue, the back and forth has to happen on the spiritual level because God, level, because God is spirit and his uh, dealings with man in an intimacy and at a level of intensity are only going to happen as spirit as, that is to say, as a spiritual person deals with a spirit God. That's what he's saying. And he's, he's articulating to her that physical location is not going to be the biggest deal. The real big deal with worship is that the spirit of man connects with the spirit of the living God. Now, we know later on, we'll have the revelation that uh, Jesus was identified by John the Baptist as the one that would baptize with the spirit. And so Jesus is alluding to that even now. In verse 25, the woman, after hearing this, she says, um, well, whenever the Messiah comes, he'll settle all this. I, I, I'm unsure if the woman just didn't believe Jesus or if she was just not willing to consent to what Jesus was saying. But what she did consent to was when the Messiah shows up, He's going to put all this to bed. He will answer these questions authoritatively. And Jesus says in verse 26, I did speak unto thee and he. So Jesus, in a very rare instance, 
tells this woman to her face that he was the Messiah. Now, once that happens, and this this is this this interaction is, um, uh, I went you know verse almost verse by verse so you can understand the exchange here. Um, now the narrative starts to switch up a little bit. We find in verse twenty seven that at this point. When Jesus admits to this woman that he's the Messiah, after doing all this, you know, conversational work with her and engaging her on these different levels of um, natural thirst and telling her that she needs to uh, be satisfied so that her soul's thirst for everlasting life um, would be um, uh, uh, met and satiated. Um, Jesus has also spoken to her about uh, the place to worship. Jesus has also revealed to her that uh, worshiping in spirit and in truthfulness was the way that God was preferring and searching for people to worship for him. When all this happens, the disciples come back. So now this, this matters because it's one thing for Pastor Jesus to be talking to this Samaritan woman, and it's just the two of them. It, it's a great narrative. It's tremendously instructive. When the disciples come back, they have some issues. The disciples are marveling. That means they're about in shock because not only is Jesus talking to this Samaritan, He's talking to a Samaritan woman. Now the disciples, they gone in town to get some food and come back. Jesus was tired, so they went out there to get some food to take care of their pastor Jesus. They come back, he's having a conversation with the Samaritan woman and no one else is around. And so they're in shock. Furthermore, what is known in this time and for um, uh, Jesus and his disciples was that the rabbi's tradition was not to speak to women in the open. And so when they come back and see Jesus speaking to this Samaritan woman, they're about taking back, you know, in their minds, you can imagine them screaming internally, what are you doing? Like what, what we left for only a certain amount of time and you're out having a full on conversation with this woman that has no one else around. This was not something that was done. But in the Bible says that uh, the, the disciples, they didn't, they didn't say anything out loud. And so they're just, you know, you know, watching in shock. And the woman, after the disciples show up, she drops her water pot, she's gone into the city. And when she goes into the city, what she tells the people in the city is, is pertinent. One, because we've already watched Jesus evangelize the woman. We watched Jesus use common ground to convey spiritual truths. Okay, living water, when they were both there for water, got it. Now watch this woman. This woman just received the revelation that Jesus was the Messiah. Just received the revelation that she was to worship God in spirit and in truth. Listen to her witness. And, and I say this because this is, this is special. Because this is not a polished evangelist. She's not. She just goes and tells what she knew. That's it. That is it. So for everyone that you know is having um, uh, an issue or frankly, a confidence issue whenever it comes to talking about Jesus, watch her. This is what she said. Verse 29, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is this not the Christ? That's her entire, uh, that's her entire testimony. All she said was, come and look at him. You, you come and check him out. You know, this is the guy that, that told me everything I ever did. So this is not a polished theological um, uh, 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 thesis that she's delivered. She did not go in there and as a skilled orator go and sit everyone down and, and, and convince them. She didn't deliver an apologetic. She just said, come see because he told me everything I, that, that I did. He said, she said, come see because of what he did for me. That's all she did. And it is recorded in verse 30 that they, that's to say a number of the Samaritans came out to meet Jesus. That's all it took. She had to go to people and tell what she knew about Jesus. So in verse 31, because a number of things happening right now. You know, the disciples showed up. They're shocked. They don't know why and how Pastor Jesus is talking to this woman from Samaria. Um, and, and she takes off and she, you know, has this um, evangelistic uh, sermon where all she says is, he told me everything I did. Come look at him. Just, just come. Just come look at him. In verse 31, the disciples, you know, they, they come and they, and they, you know, have a word with Pastor Jesus. And they says, well, sir, we got food. Um, we need to eat. Clearly you're tired. We need, we need to eat. And Jesus tells 
his elders and his fellow uh, missionaries, he tells them, I have food and nourishment that you don't know anything about. And in verse 34, he says that my nourishment is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And so Jesus is articulating that Jesus is nourished and satiated by doing the will of God and finishing that will of God. So this is something. Now, Jesus goes on to talk with the, the disciples that are, you know, drawn to him, trying to get Jesus to eat, eat, eat some food. Eat. I, I know you're tired. I know you're hungry. I know you're thirsty. Eat, sir. Uh, verse 35, it says, I don't want you all. This is Jesus talking in verse 35. He says, don't look on a harvest as if it's only a natural thing. The common knowledge amongst Jesus and his disciples was the time of harvest and the time of planting. And so Jesus says, now you know and I know at the time of harvest is ah, four-ish months. Don't think like that. The time of harvest is now because as you can see, the fields are white with harvest. That is to say, the harvest is ready now. Now, you and I can imagine that while in verse 30, we found that the Samaritans were coming to see and listen to Jesus, that perhaps Jesus was referring to the fact that this woman went out there, this Samaritan woman went out there, said what she knew, and now there are people coming to Jesus, like a harvest is being reaped, a harvest of believers in Jesus. Verse 36 says, he that reapeth receiveth wages. Now, to reap a harvest means to go out there and pull up all the crops that have grown after being planted and after they spent their time, you know, germinating, however plants grow. I know it's water, time, planting, things of that nature. Um, but Jesus says that when one reaps, they get wages. Because in that time, people were sent into the harvest fields to pull up all the crops. And those people, those reapers that would reap up all the crops, they would get paid. Well, Jesus is saying, you know this. And so the people that reap the harvest, they're going to get their wages, Samaritan woman. Um, they're going to get their wages. And Jesus says in verse 36 that they're gathering fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth, that means to plant the seeds, and he that reapeth, that means the ones that pulls up the crops that have been grown, they're going to rejoice together. Verse 37 says, this is how that saying goes, one sows and another reaps. And Jesus says, I'm sending you all to reap in places where you never planted seeds. And Jesus is speaking of the harvest of believers. Jesus is saying that his disciples would be sent out into these uh, places and circles where they could reap a harvest of believers in Jesus, even though those fields, those places and um, uh, settings where believers are to be brought into the kingdom of God were only planted by Old Testament writers, prophets, um, God himself. He's, Jesus is telling the disciples that you don't need to worry about who sowed. I'm sending you to reap. Just the way you're watching a Samaritan woman go and reap. And now you've seen folks that are coming and converging on us right now. Well, in verse 39, we find that many of the Samaritans of that city believed on Jesus because of what the Samaritan woman said. Right in keeping with this harvest reaping imagery that Jesus is speaking to his disciples about. He says, in verse 39, says, many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. It wasn't a complicated um, uh, oratory rendering. She just said, he, he told me everything I did. And many people believed because of that. So when the Samaritans continued to converge on Jesus and listen to him, they liked what he was saying so much to the point where they asked Jesus and his party, his disciples, to stay another two days. Did you hear what I said? I said in contested territory, in a place where Jews were likely less welcome, and the Jews and Samaritans were to be at odds with each other, these people, when they heard about Jesus, and they came to listen to Jesus, they welcomed Jesus. And so we find that there aren't barriers that are adequate enough to keep people from this living water, from the testimony of Jesus. Here we find that this harvest being ready to be reaped, these believers, they were ready and they were so ready, they wanted Jesus to stay another two days. And we find in verse 41 that a lot of people 
even more than believe that the beginning of those two days believed Jesus, not because of the one, what the woman said, but because they came and heard Jesus themselves, and then they became believers. And so we have this large reaping of the harvest of believers that's happening, one, because the woman uh, went and she, she evangelized to the, the people in the city, and two, because the people came and heard Jesus for themselves, and once they heard Jesus, then they believed as well. One note that I do not want to move over quickly is at the end of verse 42. Of course, these believers, after their interaction with Jesus, some of them only believed because they heard Jesus themselves, not just because of the woman, while a number of people believed because of what the woman said. We find that these people in Samaria, they knew something. They got a, a, an understanding of Jesus' identity, and his identity is Christ. That is to say, the anointed one, the savior of the world. The Samaritans knew this. That is to say, not the Jews, not the people that were most closely related by physical DNA to Jesus. You know, not the folks that were of the um, religious um, religious high class in Jerusalem. Uh, 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 uh. These people were Samaritans folks that were branded outsiders, folks that were outcasts, they got the understanding that Jesus was the Christ, the Savior of the world, and they knew it. So now we're going to keep going with the narrative here. This entire episode here happened as Jesus went to an, a place of outcasts, and he did not have regard for that whole stigma that says, don't speak to them. And they came to understand and know that Jesus was the, the Savior of the world in the place of outcasts. Well, Jesus continued on his journey and he continued to go north because that was that's what he was doing anyway. He was going north and he stopped for a while in Samaria. And what happens is Jesus goes into a region called Galilee and he wants to get up to Galilee because it's a known thing to Jesus and to a number of the, his students that in a prophet's hometown, it's a lot more difficult to win people over to God's word. Uh, verse 44 says, Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor his own country. And so Jesus went on up to his own space, Galilee again. Um, because while the Samaritans knew that Jesus was the Savior of the world and the Christ, the Galileans, according to verse 45, they basically received Jesus because they saw what he did. Which is not the same. You know, to enjoy Jesus as a miracle worker or put him to work on your behalf is different than knowing Jesus' identity and who he is, the savior of the world. That is to say, the, the Christ, the one anointed by God to bring everlasting life into the lives of so many. That's a very different thing. So Jesus gets up to Galilee. And like I said, in verse 45, they received him because they saw what Jesus did in Jerusalem. They saw uh, and, and they heard Jesus. They received him because of what he did. And Jesus comes into contact with a official or a nobleman. Now, a number of historians have uh, done their research, and the consensus is that this nobleman may have been a part of the royal court of King Herod. At any rate, this nobleman finds Jesus because Jesus has finally come close enough to him. Jesus makes it into Galilee, and this guy is in the region of Galilee, even though he was a ways away in the city called Capernaum. Jesus had moved into a city called Cana in the region of Galilee. And yes, if you're remembering, Cana of Galilee was the place where Jesus turned water into wine. Well, this nobleman shows a good amount of faith. And I'll show you how and where here. How are we doing on time? I'll show you how and where here. In verse 47, the nobleman comes to Jesus and he asks him to please come to my house to heal my son because he's about to die. My son has an illness. He's about to die. Please come and heal him. Remember I told you the Galileans saw what Jesus did, what Jesus did. So they knew he had ability. They knew he had power. And so this nobleman asked Jesus to come to his home so that he can heal his son. And Jesus responds in verse 48 of John chapter 4. And he responds to the nobleman, but he uses plural terms indicating that Jesus is speaking to the crowd around him. He says, unless y'all see signs and wonders, y'all are not going to believe. 
And so the nobleman responds, he's, uh, um, uh, he responds with the same request. Please come to my house to heal my son. He's about to die. Like he's deathly ill. Please come and heal my son. And so Jesus tells the man, go your way. Your son's going to live. And the nobleman believed Jesus' words. So we have at least three different instances where this nobleman's faith in Jesus has been exhibited. Twice he said, come, I believe you can heal. Come and touch him. And then thirdly, when Jesus says, you go your way, he's healed. The nobleman believed what Jesus, Jesus said. Well, the nobleman, he gets on his way. And while he's on his way, the nobleman's servants come to him and tell him, your son's healed. He's good. He, he's better now. He, he's living. And what we find is that the nobleman, he immediately does a, an inquiry, an investigation. He wants to know when. When did he get better? And... What the servants tell him is that he got better in the same hour that Jesus told that nobleman, that father, that pleading father, go your way, your son lives. And this is the result of this. Once that nobleman found out that Jesus' words healed his son from a, a good distance away, because again, they were in different towns. The nobleman's son was alive in Capernaum while Jesus was in Cana. At that point, the father knew it was the same hour. And in verse uh, 53, we find that the father, that is to say this nobleman, that is to say this person that is not um, recorded here in this narrative as a Jew, so potentially a Gentile according to a number, number of scholars, this person, he believed in Jesus, not only him, but his entire household. So now we are at the juncture where Jesus knew that signs and wonders to some would be necessary and he has obliged them for the purpose that they believe him. And this nobleman, after having his son restored and having his son healed, believed in Jesus and his entire household believed in Jesus. Verse 54 is the last verse in John 4. It says, this is the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. Of course, the first a reference to turning the water into wine. So that is John 4. Now, I think I will save a number of questions for a different time. Let me go ahead and close this out. Um, please forgive me. Uh, last week, I had a uh, number of uh, impediments, but we're all good now. Um, I was uh, blessed to participate in a mission trip with Every Nation's Church. We went on a mission, and missions were accomplished. Um, the record was that over 800 souls uh, were saved, people were healed, um, demons were routed, and God was glorified in that place in Mexico. So, uh, to God be the glory. Let me go ahead and pray, or let me go ahead and pray, so you can continue with uh, with your evening. Uh, those of you all that have questions, you can go ahead and drop them in. Um, the message box um, and perhaps whenever I get a collection of uh, questions we can uh, address those together our Father and our God thank you for your grace and your mercy thank you for being good to us thank you for showing us who you are thank you for relating to us in uh, terms that we can understand so that we can have that great gift that you have come to give us thank you for that everlasting life that you've granted every one of us that is saved on this line thank you so much for offering your gift of everlasting life to everyone. Thank you for reaching out uh, to make contact with us no matter where we are. Uh, please have your way in our lives. Please continue to help us to digest this chapter and these lessons that you've taught us here on tonight and make it so that they would uh, make us better for you, that they would deepen our understanding of you and your purposes and your strategies and your will. Uh, grant us courage so that whenever the opportunity arises, we can take our testimony to whomever and tell about the goodness of Jesus and reap that harvest of believers so that uh, your name is glorified and your people edified. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen.